Welcome to part 11 of Auditing Standards number 5. Because Auditing Standards 5 has over 100 pages, very heavy, dense reading, I'm going to make it easy for the beginner to understand. And what I do is I highlight certain paragraphs, certain words, certain concepts. And this is exciting because we are at the end where I'm able to group all six of these sections together because I would call this wrap up for the external auditors. And for those of us who are SOX auditors or internal auditors, we don't have to pay attention to a good chunk of this, but there are still some key concepts. This section we're going to cover forming an opinion, and that's for the external auditors, communicating certain matters, reporting on internal controls, report date, material weaknesses, and subsequent events. This training gives context to SOX 404 requirements. It's meant to be an easy breakdown of dense words. So the table of contents here came directly out of Auditing Standards Number 5 from the PCAOB website. I have just grouped the sections into smaller chunks and made video instruction blogs out of them so that it's easy to digest. So I want you to look at the table of contents and find the sections that are of interest or focus to you and watch those videos or read those blog sections to get an idea of what these sections mean without having to read the original literature itself. But along the video, you'll see the original literature so you can refer to it. Forming an opinion. You will love the next four or five little segments I'm going to do because they're really quick because we are not the external auditors. We're focused on ourselves as the SOX auditors, as the internal auditors, as the SOX providers. And so paragraph 71 is for the external auditor that says, you've done all of this work, you now have to write an opinion on the internal controls. That's all that paragraph 71 says. And paragraph 72, 3, and 74, I've just not even included them in our training because they're not relevant for SOX auditors. And I'm teaching this course more for SOX auditors than external auditors because it really just goes into, here's the standard wording you're supposed to use, here's all of the dotting of I's and crossing of T's to form an opinion. And that's it. That's what forming an opinion is on. Then, as the external auditors, you also have to obtain written representation. So these are what we call the rep letters or representation letters. And again, I've excluded paragraphs 75, 6, and 77, because it's not relevant to internal auditors. As internal auditors, as SOX auditors, we don't get rep letters from management. Um, usually it's in our engagement letter that says management. You're responsible for your financials. You're responsible for your controls. We are not responsible. These types of rep letters are only for external auditors, and they're very legalese. There's lots of words to it. Skip it. Not relevant to us SOX auditors. This section, communicating certain matters. This is important to us. Even though communicating certain matters relates to the external auditors, we want to know what the external auditors are going to be telling our clients, they're going to be telling our management team, and so we want to know the, the requirements and what our should do's. Paragraph 78 talks about the auditor must communicate in writing to management and the audit committee. So management is the CFO, the CEO, the controller, all of those, and also to the audit committee, material weaknesses. And this written communication has to happen before they issue the auditor's reports. This has happened where it comes to the last minute and suddenly the auditors think, oh, you're going to have a material weakness. And of course, management is a surprise to management. It's a surprise to the audit committee. And that's why paragraph 78 is here to say, tell them before you issue the opinion. Now, paragraph 79, this is really something hard for the external auditors to do. Because it says, if the external auditors conclude that oversight of the company's financial reporting by the audit committee itself, the audit committee is not doing its job, the auditor has to then write communicate this in writing to the entire board of directors. 
And that's really a yucky situation. How many times does an auditor want to go and say, by the way, part of your board sucks? It's so rare. I, I rarely ever see this. The only time I see this is when there's a big blow up, like the Enrons and the Worldcoms of some sort, and the auditors are doing their CYA and they're saying, oh, we better tell everybody. In most cases, it's very rare that someone, the auditors are going to go to the full board and say, your audit committee stinks. Paragraph 80 talks about significant deficiencies. So remember, material weaknesses, the audit committee has to be notified, management has to be notified before the opinion. Now, for significant deficiencies, they do have to be communicated in writing to the audit committee, and it has to be done before the auditor's report gets issued. So just keep this in mind, because oftentimes when we are going into an audit committee meeting, the auditors have their required communication. This is one of those things, significant deficiencies are listed on there for the auditors, uh, audit committee to see. Paragraph 81 is where I've highlighted it in two different colors so that you can see there's actually two separate steps that the auditors have to do. The first one is the auditor has to communicate to management, meaning CEO, CFO, controller, VP finance, all of our accounting type of function, all of the deficiencies, whether it's material weakness, a significant deficiencies or just a listing of deficiencies during the audit and then they have to separately inform the audit committee that they've made that communication meaning you don't have to share with the audit committee the full listing of all your deficiencies you only have to share with the audit committee written communication for significant deficiency and material weakness but all of the other deficiencies, you have to communicate it in writing to management. And once you've communicated it to management, you also need to let the audit committee know. So there's a slight nuance to it in that all deficiencies, if you have 30 deficiencies, maybe the audit committee doesn't want to see it all. Most audit committee nowadays want to see it all. But the literature just says the auditors are only required to give it to management, the full detail, and then to tell the audit committee, we've given management a list. Maybe if you want to see it, you should ask your management team for it. That's what paragraph 81 is talking about. Now, paragraph 82, 3, and 4 just goes into further details about, you know, whether the severities and so forth. It's not as important. I've really highlighted for you the most important stuff in, in the previous paragraphs in 80, 80 and 81. Now, this section on reporting on internal controls, I'm also going to breeze through because five paragraph or four paragraphs, 85, 86, 87, and 88, it's all about the actual opinions that the external auditor has to uh, write for the internal controls opinion. It's not relevant to us in terms of SOX auditors or SOX practitioners, so I've removed it. I don't want to clutter your mind with extra stuff that you don't need. The reporting date. Now, I did include the reporting date for you because the auditor has to have the report date no earlier than when they've wrapped up all of their work. So you will notice the financial statements are as of the year end, so that's 1231, March 31st, June 30, but the opinion is oftentimes a month or two afterwards. That's all paragraph um, 89 is talking about is your, the date of your audit opinion is when you have substantially gathered all the evidence. Now they may have some wrap up, some tiny documentations and thing, things like that, but all of their evidence should have been obtained at that point before they can issue their audit report and date it. And that's it on the audit report date. Now, the material weaknesses, this section of material weakness more relates to what the auditors have to say in their opinion. And so paragraph 90 talks about the factors we discussed from paragraph 62 up to 70, all the evaluations of deficiencies and whether or not. But if the auditors find that there is a material weakness, they have to express an adverse opinion. 
That's a bad opinion. And they also have to, in their opinion, talk about there was a material weakness that management has identified. So this paragraph 90, 91, and some of the other paragraphs after this, you'll see it's more guidance for the external auditors on what they have to say in their opinion. And as SOX auditors, we're less concerned about that, which is why I'm not going to focus on it for you. If you really wanted to know, you could actually go and read more about it. And again, you keep going through the notes and you'll see it talks about material weakness and how do you have to do the assessment. That's a lot of reading. And again, 92, more of, on whether you do a separate report on internal controls or a combined report, all external audit stuff. And that's it on material weakness reporting. Subsequent events. I've also lumped this with the external audit requirements because this is all these paragraphs. I'm just going to cruise through to say that the auditors, remember their audit opinion date is sometime after the end of the year has closed. And so between the end of the year, the company's year end, and when the auditors sign their opinion, there will be subsequent events. There will be things that are happening. And paragraph 93, 94, will just talk about here are the things that the external auditors have to do to make sure that their opinion is still good. They have to look at internal audit reports, any independent information, any regulatory type of agency reports that they get to make sure that their opinion, when it's dated February, when it's dated March, is still relevant and not an adverse opinion. And so you see here, it's just more discussions about the types of things the external auditors have to do, not something that you have to worry about, and more about disclosures for the external auditors. And that's it for this section of Auditing Standard 5.